still watching the smart rise from the business information center smart 24 now on the 24th of october last year the government came up with the national health insurance bill that is going to be helping people to access health care on a basis that has especially been uh, from the insurance regulators and the people that know insurance so you want to go and be able to afford the health services from the hospital without necessarily digging into your pockets but now it has come with a lot of controversy around it and today we seek to understand it a little further to enable us to know whether it is really important for us or whether it is not important and joining me on set is mr benson quickeriza a senior legal officer regulation and drafting from the insurance regulatory authority of uganda a very good morning benson good morning how are you doing today i'm fine how are you Kim? i'm okay so for starters what is the national health insurance bill or scheme for for us to be able to begin on a clean state well for starters uh, this is a government bill, meaning that uh, it is being proposed by government itself. Okay. You know that uh, the reality on ground is that we all incur heavy and serious expenses when it comes to paying uh, our medical bills. Uh, you realize that uh, of late there are lots of uh, campaigns, save so and so, save I think there was Albo and then there was some other young man. So that indicates that uh, it is really getting difficult for an individual to meet their medical expenses. But you also realize that uh, as an individual, you often fall sick. So what the bill is about is uh, coming up with an arrangement whereby we all collectively contribute uh, to the scheme and such that uh, at any one point where an individual falls sick, they should be able to access medical facilities. Now, the issue is that government provides medical services, but the issue is that how effective are they, how relevant are they, the instances whereby you go to a medical health facility and they tell you that uh, we cannot access this drug, we have run out of stock. So they are coming up with an alternative arrangement such that everything is streamlined. So for purposes of history, this bill has been in the making for over 10 years. I think there was a 2012 bill, then it came to 2014, and now we have a 2019 bill. And uh, there have been changes along the way, but uh, the bill is supposed to ensure that for those who can, we can make a contribution to the scheme such that we can all access medical health facilities. Because if you look at the Constitution, uh, we have a right to, to health, and uh, this includes the right to accessing medical facilities. And this is an obligation placed on, on government. So it is coming up with, uh, with a way of ensuring that uh, we can all access these services. Okay. Yeah. The primary role of the state, as we all at least presume it to be, is to protect its citizens now. As a way of seeing that it does this, mm -hmm. the National Social Security Fund is saying, can we manage such a fund or can we spearhead such a cause? Why is it that uh, from a regulator's perspective, why are you finding issues with such? Uh, well, for, for starters, that is why it is called a health insurance scheme. Okay their insurance aspects and principles that will have to be followed. Now, under the Insurance Act 2017, there is a provision, I think Section 9, which requires any person undertaking insurance businesses to be licensed. That is for private businesses. But now, once you come up with uh, an alternative scheme, they are creating a board that should be able to manage the entire, the, the entire scheme. Now, the issue of regulation is left to the authority. That is the insurance regulatory authority. So what we're saying is that the authority should be able to touch and regulate 
the scheme. But the scheme should be run by a board as provided for under the bill. Mm -hmm. Now, my understanding of the proposal from NSSF is to help in uh, issues of collection. I think their argument is that they have systems whereby they are able to collect funds because uh, all employers make a contribution to the fund. So my understanding would be that they are pitching for assisting in the collection of the contributions to the fund. But on the issue of managing the scheme, I, th I think that will be another issue that will have to be interrogated further between the regulators because uh, NSSF itself is regulated by, by uh, Umbra. Mm -hmm. So these are matters that the regulators will have to, to sit and agree with. And certainly and they are all under established under independent acts of parliament, so it wouldn't create a, a very huge problem. Mm -hmm. But now, looking at uh, section 4, is it, it, it is section 4, I'm sure, mm -hmm. that talks about establishment of the board of uh, directors that is, going, that is going to be manning the national insurance scheme. Mm -hmm. So don't you think uh, that NSSF is trying to help to reduce the costs of administration and collection in your regard? Mm -hmm. Yes, in a way, once it comes to collection. Mm -hmm. But once it comes to management, I, I think we're going to have an issue here. Mm -hmm. Because the scheme is going to be massive, okay. it's going to be big. It will need to be independent. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, in regard to section 4, I think it may be even section 8, mm -hmm. regarding the board of the scheme. Uh, the board is very critical. And as a regulator, we have made proposals to the Committee uh, of Health in Parliament regarding the composition of the board. I think that uh, the framework proposed under the bill is adequate enough because we are looking at having particular people with particular experiences and, uh, and uh, qualifications in certain aspects like fund management, like mm -hmm. insurance, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, medical service provision. These we think are people that will be adequately uh, skilled and, uh, and knowledgeable to be able to run the fund because it needs to be run mm -hmm. independently. Okay, so for matters of independence and objectivity, that is why you're seeking to take it on alone? For matters of, uh, for matters of regulation, mm -hmm. Uh, it is appropriate that the insurance regulatory authority regulates the scheme. Because if you look at our neighbors in Kenya, it is the insurance regulatory authority that uh, is mandated to regulate the scheme. And uh, that change came about recently through an amendment of the Act because they realized the importance of having the insurance regulator oversee such a scheme. So I don't think we're calling for too much then in making such a request okay so speaking of kenya which has successfully implemented it algeria and many other countries on the african continent what are some of the things that you feel are in the bill and haven't been uh, compared well with what the people that have successfully uh, implemented it have done well uh, there are a couple of issues mm. and uh, my major concern as a person is uh, is the way that we are actually pushing towards implementation of the scheme. Okay. In the previous bills, that was 2012 and 2014, the proposal was that it is gradually phased, such that you start on a small category of people, maybe public servants and civil servants, then you keep incorporating in more people mm -hmm. as you manage the scheme. And, and that is what has probably been done with, uh, with other economies. But uh, for Uganda here, the push is for everyone to first get on board. Then we can actually implement it. And, and, and I think once we start big, mm. we are bound to make lots of mistakes. Okay. I would want to be optimistic, but the reality is that uh, in case there are any challenges with such a massive thing, mm. then the challenges are going to be massive. So probably uh, I'll probably push for a reconsideration that mm. we, we have it phased systematically and gradual okay. such that we iron out some of those challenges as we move forward. The other issue is also that uh, for other economies, there is, uh, there is recognition of other schemes, which was initially in the previous bills, but then it drops. 
I would understand the reasoning that yes, we need funds to have everyone on board, mm -hmm. but uh, for other economies, the push is that everyone must have medical insurance. So regardless of whether you're having uh, you're part of the national scheme, or regardless of whether you have uh, private medical insurance, or you're part of a community-based scheme, the hypothesis is that everyone has medical insurance. So other countries have taken that route, but uh, for us as a, as, as a country, given the challenges of wanting to have everyone on board such that we can subsidize for those that cannot uh, make a contribution, uh, that is why we are taking that route, okay. which is basically for national interest okay so the bill calls for a four percent deduction of the workers salary so what's your comment uh, about this from an employee perspective because now we've been having nssf yeah. you've been having to pay nssf and all the other deductibles from your gross income so mm. the four percent in addition to the uh, five percent that has always been deducted mm. what is your comment about this from an employee's perspective well from an employee's perspective mm. uh, I think we we already make lots of contributions in form of taxes to government, and uh, you have, uh, as you pointed out, NSSF, which is for my benefit uh, when I retire. But then you also have other contributions you make, like local service tax, which is uh, 100,000 annually, and then you have pay as you earn, which is 30 percent, and now we are looking at uh, an additional contribution of an amount that is yet to be contributed, that is yet to be determined. Uh, I want to clarify that if you look at the bill, it, uh, it provides for a contribution amount to be determined uh, in the regulations. Now, the issues of 4%, 1% uh, are just proposals, okay? But uh, as an individual, I realize that it is going to actually impact on my take home uh, when you talk in terms of salary okay, okay? you recall you will also acknowledge that uh, as individuals we also have loans you have a bank loan you have uh, uh, a loan from your employer so your take home is going to diminish uh, drastically but uh, also you need to realize the importance of having such a contribution okay. because in the event that you fall sick you're already catered for. That is for those that do not have medical insurance as uh, part of their benefits uh, from their employer. So for those that do not have that package, I, I think it is something that uh, is beneficial uh, to the individual, but uh, I also recognize the fact that it is going to drastically affect my take-home salary as an individual now now recognizing that the take home is going to diminish a little bit mm -hmm. now you have the you've been uh, having many people in terms of uh, the ones you've been insuring as a regulator okay mm -hmm. you have uh, you have companies that have been insuring quite a number of individuals yes. okay and now these people have been dealing with these employees and it's on the take home that they've been deducting to get other policies from these insurers so what do you think uh, the insurers should be looking at right now in terms of uh, uptake of such policies? Uh, well, for maybe for clarity, mm. we, we regulate insurers. Yes. Now, the insurers are the ones that offer these policies, mm. that offer the cover. Okay? So now what happens is that uh, my understanding is that majority of the people in employment have had these benefits paid off for them by their employer. Okay, so that means that uh, the effect is not basically felt on their earnings. It is an extra additional benefit uh, given to them by their employer. Now, what happens is that uh, the scheme does not prohibit uh, a person being part of a private scheme. What it is saying is that uh, first make a contribution to this national scheme and then acquire basic minimum insurance cover. Okay. Then you can top up uh, additional benefits by going to a private medical health service provider. Okay. Yeah. So is such a move possible with a very large informal sector in Uganda? And in case, if at all it is possible, how best are you going to package it for the informal sector? 
the, the challenge has always been uh, getting people in the informal sector on board. Personally, I think that uh, it is a little bit unfair mm -hmm. uh, for a person in employment to make a contribution of 4% per month of their salary, and then you find that a person in formal employment is making a contribution of 100 of 100,000 per month. You realize that there are people in the informal sector who earn hundreds and millions of shillings, but now their contribution to the fund will be minimum and is capped. So what we're actually pushing for mm -hmm. is for coming up with an elaborate framework that will be able to weed out such people such that they can also make a meaningful contribution to the fund because what we want is equity mm. in making contribution to the scheme. Okay, mm. so now moving forward, uh, the, bill, uh, the bill itself uh, has started a lot of debate and a very huge debate, most of the Ugandans that are outside of the country, Ugandans in the diaspora, because when you try to look at the bill, it excludes them. Mm. Is there any deliberate effort or any kind of uh, um, uh, proposal that you're taking to the framers or government mm. to include the people in the diaspora in alignment with the principle of um, uh, solidarity? Uh. Well, uh, one of the proposals we made to, to the Committee on Health and Parliament and also to the Ministry of Health, because we've had a couple of meetings with them uh, regarding the bill and how we can uh, improve it, is the issue of the term of uh, ordinarily resident in Uganda. Because uh, the bill talks about uh, a person ordinarily resident in Uganda making a contribution to the scheme. Our proposal is that uh, that definition needs to be further broadened and clarified on such that, for example, if I'm a foreign student, for example, from, uh, from Kenya, from Sudan, from Rwanda, studying in Uganda, uh, my status in regard to the bill is, is known. If I'm uh, a Ugandan citizen, living abroad but making uh, back and forth travels back to my country that needs to be taken care of if i'm uh, an ambassador of a nation stationed here in kampala mm -hmm. some of these things need to be further polished for purposes of specificity and for purposes of being clear and once we have that clearly done then that issue will be uh, ironed out Okay, so what do you think will be the coexistence of uh, such a scheme with uh, the private clinics? Because I understand you've been working with, uh, you've been regulating uh, uh, insurers who've been working mostly with bigger hospitals. Mm. Uh, IHK mentioned them. Mm. So what will be the coexistence of such a bill mm. in relation to the private clinics that are many in the country? We think that the bill will also work to help the private schemes get uh, get a bit of business because uh, the arrangement proposed now is that uh, initially for one to access maybe IHK or Nakasero Hospital or Kampala Hospital you have to be part uh, of a private scheme that offers you that medical insurance but what is proposed under the bill is that uh, there is going to be accreditation as well of private medical facilities. This will mean that provided I'm under the National Health Insurance Scheme, the, the scheme is going to also accredit private hospitals. By accreditation it means that it will recognize certain medical health facilities where a member under the National Health Insurance Scheme will go to that private clinic and access a service. Now, that means that for an individual, an ordinary Ugandan, you can have access to this private scheme, to these private hospitals, which many think are a little bit too expensive mm -hmm. and only accessible by a certain category of people. But also for the health facility, you're going to get business from uh, members of the public. Okay? So what this will mean is that it will encourage uh, better service, because you'll have the public medical facilities being uh, reviewed and also being uh, assessed in regard to service provision vis-a-vis -vis the private medical schemes. So, in short, 
the private medical schemes, once accredited, mm -hmm. will be able to have uh, greater clientele from members of the public who would not ordinarily have accessed their services. Are there any key success factors that should be there for successful implementation of such a bill in a country like Uganda? Yes, there are. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, I think that there are three critical things that we need to look at. The three. first three. Okay. I think the first and the most important one is actually getting it right with that bill. Because the bill is the basis upon which the entire scheme is going to be run. Okay? That is why you need to be thorough once you're coming up with this bill. You need to be realistic and you need to do it in such a way that uh, you can afford flexibility. Now, we need to make sure that the bill is properly crafted. Uh, we need to be realistic when we're coming up with this bill and if we get it right then no doubt it should be a scheme that will be easy to implement so the first thing and most important get the bill correct and that will provide a good foundation for us to have a scheme that can be run what are some of the what are some of the constructs of getting the getting the bill right on the side of government because it is the one that is coming up with such a proposal i i, I think uh, the way that all bills the system of actually generating bills and acts mm -hmm. is uh, is detailed and uh, this bill is also taking that framework whereby you have a lot of consultations uh, from different stakeholders and the consultations have been done uh, the authority has met with the committee. There are different uh, people, uh, other stakeholders, employers, uh, medical health service providers have all given their views to the Committee of Health and par the, the Parliamentary Committee of Health. Now, what means is that as we make our proposals, the committee should be able to sieve out all our issues and to be able to have them considered and uh, appropriately catered for under the bill. And even as the discussion comes up in Parliament, these things should be considered. Once they are considered, then we should be able to come up with a very good law, which will provide a very good basis for the scheme to run efficiently. Moving forward to the mm -hmm. second other. Now, the second other is the issue of uh, national acceptance. Uh, as soon as uh, this bill came out, there was a bit of uh, concern and a bit of resistance. You find that uh, employers are raising their issues, employee associations are raising their issues, and there's a bit of misunderstanding, okay? Because this is a contribution to the scheme such that I can access medical facilities. But some people think that it is a tax, okay? That already shows you that there is an issue regarding acceptance. Okay. okay? So I think that uh, we need to have uh, consensus as a nation. We need to agree that this is important for each and every citizen. And then we need to see how we can support the successful implementation of the scheme. So whose onus is it exactly to ensure that the nationals or the population in Uganda accepts this and gets it in good faith? I, I think the role belongs to each and every one of us. That is why I'm here on TV okay. trying to, to push mm. uh, for the scheme, trying to actually sensitize people okay. about the positives of the scheme for us, then government definitely has to take the core responsibility. It could do it through the Ministry of Health as the responsible ministry, uh, such that there is national acceptance in regard to us having a functional scheme. Because I think we're the only country in the region that doesn't have something in that regard. Okay, the third the, key success factor. The third key success factor is sensitization. I, I think we all need to be sensitized. Uh, there are so many positive aspects in there that we need to actually have people learn about. We need to sensitize people about their obligations under the scheme and under the bill and uh, what will be required of them and how they can access these services. Uh, once people are more knowledgeable and sensitized about the proposals and once it is rolled out how it will be functioning, then you should have 
a very successful scheme. Okay, so have, have you as a regulator gone ahead to ask the employers who in the proposal are entitled to pay 1% on the entire contribution to the scheme? Have you consulted the employers to know exactly how it will affect them and if at all they have to accept it? Well, uh, as, as a regulator, mm. we are not really into that regard mm. because we think that uh, would be preempting actions that have not yet been determined by the bill. But we think that once the bill is passed as an act of parliament okay. and then we are certain about the provisions of these acts mm. and the role of the regulator clearly spelled out, because these are things that, that are not clear. Mm -hmm. Then we can be able to ensure that we enforce our mandate once it is categorically placed in the context of the bill. Okay, so yeah. from a so right now, from a regulator's perspective, mm -hmm. uh, the bill is uncertain. Okay. But once it is concluded and passed as an act of parliament, then we can guarantee you that we will be able to exercise that mandate once it is entrusted to us. So he who comes before the law must come with clean hands. So at least we can, can we rule out the fact that the bill is coming on a clean slate, uh, the people having good intentions behind it or? Well, uh, like I earlier pointed out, mm -hmm. the bill is well intentioned for Uganda as a country, mm -hmm. okay? The bill is brought in public interest. Because you realize that there are instances where every day in the newspaper you're reading about a mother or a child or a sick person who has been held in a hospital because they cannot pay medical bills. These are things that we need to address, that the bill will address once you have a national scheme running. We think at least it will reduce on some of these instances. Because if you look at the medical services that they're accessing and the services that they're paying, they're failing to pay, it is these basic services that will be catered for under the scheme. Secondly, the constitution mandates the government to provide a framework for access to services which include the education and also health. Oh. And uh, the scheme is a framework of government uh, coming up with such a system such that uh, people can access the services. So just to reassure everyone mm -hmm. that this bill is well intentioned and is bound to benefit each and every one of us because everyone at one point will have to fall sick. And it is giving you that coverage and assurance that mm -hmm. should you fall sick at any one point, then you can access these medical services. So we had a conversation around this with a colleague of mine, Saddam Mobali. So I hope Saddam and the sect of the people that you do represent and think to the contrary, that there are ill intentions behind this bill. I hope you can get this from a person that is coming from the regulatory authority to know that this is a bill for you. So now uh, we've seen uh, all that. So should we say uh, the impact, should we give us a reading into the impact of such a bill, if at all well implemented and pandering to all the things that you as the regulator are fronting, mm -hmm. what do you think will be the uh, resultant effect on the economy in general? Well, uh, I could look at it from two aspects, okay? Mm. As an individual, mm. it will reduce on your out-of-pocket uh, out pocket expenses mm. in regard to medical services. That will mean that once I fall sick, mm. I do not have to go dig into my wallet, pull out 100,000, 200,000 to actually pay for medical services. This will mean that I can access service and ordinarily there will be a reduction in my expenditure on medical services which will mean that I'll have a lot more money uh, generated such that I can actually channel it for use for other development purposes. So that will mean that financially as an individual I will grow and I will be able to invest this money into other productive avenues, maybe do some small business, which indirectly will contribute to growth of the economy. But then also in regard to people that will have their medical facilities accredited, it is expected that there will be growth in business. Because as they offer this service, they are going to offer, uh, they are going to actually send their fee notes or charges to the scheme, which will be bound to pay them. That will mean that there will be growth 
in revenue on their part, which will also ultimately transcend into development of the economy. So I think that uh, indirectly we should be able to see growth in the economy. The other challenge also is that in the event that we do not get uh, the scientific determination of the contributions right, uh, the scheme may end up incurring expenses and being heavily indebted. And the issue is who will now be able to actually cater for these deficits. Okay. So it, it is two way, but we are optimistic that uh, ultimately it will uh, see the growth of uh, a healthy person because once you access the services, you're healthy, you're able to contribute more to national growth and development. Okay, yeah. so, you so you have a very healthy labor force. A very healthy labor force. Yeah. You're parting short around this very topic before we continue on to other things that are, high, uh, that are happening within the country. Yeah, well, uh, my parting short is to encourage everyone to positively receive this bill, to be very inquisitive, to ask more questions, to make sure that uh, if they have any other issues, they are pushed uh, to the Committee of Parliament, uh, or to government, or to their elective representatives, they have MPs they can access. Let us engage in this discussion such that by the time it comes out as a law, all our concerns are actually catered for. But then also, most importantly, please be mindful of the obligation that is going to be bestowed on you as an individual towards the successful implementation of the scheme and uh, deliver the gospel as well for pushing for the scheme because we all need it because it is an alternative to us because at one point in life you've contributed to a friend's medical bill to your uh, relatives uh, bill so once you have such a scheme in place mm -hmm. then we hope that most of these aspects of making contributions and fundraising for people who are sick and cannot afford medical expenses uh, are addressed mm -hmm.